Good afternoon. We're here today for a virtual town hall regarding an officer-involved shooting that occurred on Friday, May 7th, 2020 on Varney Place between Jack London Alley and 3rd Street in the south of Market neighborhood of San Francisco. Before, before proceeding, I'd like to announce to our viewing and listening audience that we have sign language interpretation services here this afternoon to assist persons who are deaf or hard of hearing. This town hall is also being translated into Spanish and Cantonese for members of our community who speak those languages. Today's presentation will include details from an officer involved shooting incident that resulted in non life threatening injuries to Mr. Xavier Pittman Jr. We recognize the traumatic impacts that officer involved shootings can have on members of our communities, especially for families and loved ones. To any of our viewers experiencing trauma from this incident or from inf information or images presented during this town hall, please know that help is available to you. You may contact the San Francisco Department of Public Health Crisis Line at 415-970-3800 for trauma services. After our presentation, we will allow one hour for public questions and comments. We estimate that this town hall will end at 5.30 p.m. So here's what we'd like to accomplish today. First and foremost, we want to continue to earn your trust and legitimacy by being transparent through this presentation. We will be releasing facts known to us at this time about the incident in a manner that is informative and impartial. In the spirit of transparency, accountability, and just doing what's right, I'm departing from our normal town hall protocols and will make a statement regarding this incident based on what we know at this time from the evidence and facts of this case, including video evidence, witness, and our members' statements. Based on our analysis of the facts and evidence we have at this time, the shooting of Mr. Pittman quite simply should not have happened. I'm deeply sorry that Mr. Pittman was shot during this incident and I'd like to take this opportunity to publicly apologize to Mr. Pittman, his family and his friends. I also want to say to the public that I'm truly sorry as I know and we know you expect us to get this right and we know how traumatic it is to see these types of incidents especially when they should not have happened. Shortly, Commander Robert O'Sullivan will discuss the facts of this case, but before I turn this over to Commander O'Sullivan, I'd like to emphasize that this is an ongoing investigation. As such, there may be some information that we cannot release at this time, either because the facts are not yet clearly established or because the release of certain information is either prohibited by law or could compromise the investigation. Next, unlike most officer involved shooting town halls in recent years, no body worn camera footage was captured in this incident. That is because the San Francisco police officers involved in this incident were working a plainclothes district station assignment. Current SFPD policies allow body worn camera exemptions for officers working certain plainclothes operations. This particular operation met the body worn camera exemption. However, with that said, business surveillance video camera footage in the area and immediate vicinity of the officer involved shooting captured various portions of this incident. Those videos will be presented during Commander O'Sullivan's presentation shortly, and additional video is being sought by investigators. Although we've been committed to transparency with our officer involved shooting investigations for several years now, this level of transparency is consistent with California's police transparency law that was implemented with the passage of Senate, Senate Bill 1421. All the footage or all the information we will release in this town hall, including video footage and audio recordings, will be posted on the SFPD website at sanfranciscopolice.org, where, where it will remain available in perpetuity for public inspection. Next, 
San Francisco Police Department directives mandate that we release the name of the officers from officer-involved shootings within 10 days of the incident unless safety concerns argue against disclosure. In this manner, pardon me, in this matter, no safety concerns have been identified and the name of the involved officer will be released during Commander Robert O'Sullivan's presentation of the facts of this incident. We've conducted a thorough safety assessment in this case, and we have identified, as I said, no safety concerns. Next, I'd like to explain the investigative processes for an officer-involved shooting. San Francisco has a multi-agency response to officer-involved shootings, and each agency's investigation is independent. When an officer-involved shooting occurs in San Francisco involving an on-duty San Francisco police officer, the following agencies are immediately notified. The San Francisco Police Department's investigative services detail and the San Francisco Police Department internal affairs detail. The San Francisco District Attorney's Office Independent Investigations Bureau, also known as IIB, is also notified, as well as the San Francisco Department of Police Accountability, also known as DPA. All notified agencies immediately dispatch investigators and appropriate personnel to the scene to begin their respective and independent investigations. As far as investigative processes related to the OIS, there are five general areas of investigative responsibility. First, SFPD's investigative services detail is the investigative unit responsible for investigating any underlying criminal activity that led up to the officer-involved shooting. In this case, the underlying criminal activity being investigated by SFPD's investigative services detail is a series of auto burglaries that occurred in the city and county of San Francisco involving a gray Mitsubishi. Second, internal affair, our internal affairs division, SFPD's internal affairs division, is responsible for conducting an administrative investigation to determine if the officer or officers responsible for the OIS are in compliance with the standards and responsibilities of SFPD policy. Although the investigations of both SFPD units run in parallel, each has a distinct investigative purview and focus. Each maintains a strict internal firewall to comply with legal standards and requirements. Third, the San Francisco District Attorney's Office Independent Investigation Bureau, or IIB, is the lead investigative unit responsible for investigating whether the officer or officers involved use deadly force or any associated force, and that that force is legal and in accordance with the criminal laws of the state of California. The District Attorney's investigations and findings are independent of the San Francisco Police Department's investigation and administrative findings. Based on the findings of the District Attorney's Independent Investigations Bureau, or IIB, the District Attorney of the City and County of San Francisco is authorized to determine whether or not the involved officer or officers have violated criminal laws, and accordingly, whether or not to file criminal charges against the officer or officers. The fourth independent investigative process is the San Francisco Department of Police Accountability, also known as DPA. San Francisco voters created DPA as a, as a successor to the Office of Citizen Complaints with their passage of Proposition D in June 2016, in the June 2016 election. DPA investigates all SFPD incidents in which any of our officers discharge a weapon within the course and scope of their duties whenever that discharge results in an individual's injury or death. The fifth and final independent investigative process is that of the San Francisco Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, or OCME. The medical examiner has responsibility for conducting an on-scene investigation, collecting evidence, and taking custody of a deceased person in any officer-involved shooting that results in a fatality. In tragic cases that result in fatalities, the OCME is responsible for conducting an autopsy to determine the decedent's cause of death and to report those findings publicly. Thankfully, 
No fatality resulted from last Friday's officer-involved shooting on Varney Place. Accordingly, the San Francisco Medical Examiner has no investigative role in this incident. As I said, we will allocate one hour for public comments and questions and conclude this town hall at approximately 5.45 p.m. And before we move on to Commander O'Sullivan, I just want to reiterate, um, I am truly sorry to Mr. Pittman and his family, his friends and the people of San Francisco that this incident occurred. I will return after Commander O'Sullivan's presentation for some final comments before we open it up for questions. Thanks again for joining us and tuning in. Good afternoon. The officer involved shooting incident that occurred on May 7th, 2021 at Varney Place and Jack London Alley was preceded by six separate incidents. The incidents consist of the following. Five auto burglaries, which occurred from approximately 1144 AM to 1245 PM in the Richmond and Central Police Districts of San Francisco. And one instance during which the suspect vehicle fled from a neighboring police agency agency during a traffic stop attempt. The officer involved shooting incident discussed in this presentation involves plainclothes members of the San Francisco Police Department assigned to the Central Police District. The plainclothes officers were conducting an auto burglary surveillance and arrest operation when the officer involved shooting occurred. The precise chronology of these incidents is currently under investigation. The times presented are approximate. The following is a summary of the events as they are understood as of today, Thursday, May 13th, 2021. At approximately 11.44 a.m., witnesses observed an auto burglary near the Japanese Tea Garden. This location is within Golden Gate Park in the Richmond Police District of San Francisco. The suspect vehicle was described by witnesses as a silver Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. A license plate was provided and later deemed to be stolen. The suspects were observed breaking a vehicle window, stealing bags from the vehicle, and fleeing the scene in the Mitsubishi. At approximately 12.04 p.m., the U.S. Park Police observed the same silver Mitsubishi in the Presidio area of San Francisco. U.S. Park Police officers attempted to make a traffic stop of the vehicle. However, the vehicle accelerated a high rate of speed, drove over a median into oncoming traffic, and fled the area driving the wrong way. U.S. Park Police subsequently called Central Police Station and notified the Central Plain Close officers of the traffic stop attempt and the evasive maneuvers by the suspect's vehicle driver. At approximately 12.10 p.m., a witness observed an auto burglary at Leavenworth and Jeff Jefferson Streets in the Central Police District. The witness in this incident heard glass break and observed a suspect enter a vehicle window and retrieve a purse in a bag. The suspect then entered a silver Mitsubishi with left, which left the area. The vehicle had the same license plate as the vehicle described in the Golden Gate Park auto burglary. At approximately 12.20 p.m., an auto burglary occurred at Pier 35 in the Central Police District. A witness described observing the occupant of a silver Mitsubishi enter a vehicle and steal luggage before fleeing in the vehicle. A witness flagged down a passing University of California Police Department officer who later reported this information to the SFPD. At approximately 12.31 p.m., the Department of Emergency Management broadcast information about a silver Mitsubishi with the same license plate number as those previously reported casing vehicles in the area of Pier 35. Casing is a term commonly used to describe suspicious behavior of suspects loitering near vehicles for the purpose of committing auto burglary. As a result of this broadcast and their knowledge of prior incidents, plainclothes officers from Central Station began searching the Embarcadero area for the Silver Mitsubishi. 
At approximately 12.35 p.m., two plainclothes officers observed the vehicle driving southbound on Embarcadero, approaching Washington Street. The officers conducted mobile surveillance of the vehicle and its occupants to observe their actions. The officers observed the occupants of the Mitsubishi case a parked vehicle near Washington and Drum Streets. The officers momentarily lost sight of the suspects and then saw them remove bags and items from the parked vehicle. The suspects got back into the silver Mitsubishi, which then drove away from the area. At approximately 12.40 p.m., plainclothes officers resumed their observation of the Mitsubishi and its occupants. The vehicle continued southbound on the Embarcadero and was seen double parked near an Audi, which was parked on the street. The officers briefly lost sight of the Mitsubishi as it parked near the Audi. The officers then drove by shortly after and observed that the Audi had been burglarized near where the Mitsubishi had been double parked. Plainclothes officers once again began searching the area to locate the silver Mitsubishi. At approximately 12.48 p.m., two plainclothes officers, while searching the area of Jack London Alley and Varney Place, observed the vehicle. The Mitsubishi was pulled to the side of the alley against a building, and two vehicle occupants were out of the vehicle. The two suspects were observed removing bags, luggage, and other items from the vehicle. The suspects appeared to be searching and emptying the bags and luggage onto the ground. The plainclothes officers exited their vehicle and began observing the actions of the suspects from the corner of Jack London Alley and Varney Place. One of the suspects, later identified as Xavier Pittman Jr., was, wearing, was seen wearing a black ski mask, gray sweatshirt, black t-shirt, blue pants, and black shoes. The plainclothes officers ran towards Mr. Pittman with their firearms drawn to place him under arrest. A surveillance video shows plainclothes officer number one grabbed Mr. Pittman and both fell to the ground. During the physical contact with Mr. Pittman, an officer involved shooting occurred, which resulted in one round striking Mr. Pittman in his left wrist area. The audio portion of a video, recover, video recording recovered from the scene captured one of the officers yell police, immediately followed by a single gunshot. Mr. Pittman can be heard on the audio saying that he had been shot and requesting an ambulance. The silver Mitsubishi accelerated away at a high rate of speed with the rear hatchback still open. The suspect vehicle then collided with a stopped and occupied vehicle as it proceeded west on Varney Place. The suspect vehicle was last seen on video fleeing northbound on 3rd Street. An officer broadcast a request for an ambulance and additional resources to the scene. Officers rendered medical aid to Mr. Pittman. Subsequently, an ambulance arrived and transported Mr. Pittman to a local hospital. Mr. Pittman was treated for non-life-threatening injuries at a local hospital. Based upon information known at this time, Mr. Pittman was not in possession of a weapon at the time of the incident. Preliminary evidence indicates that one officer fired one round from his department-issued firearm. The second officer on the scene did not fire his department-issued firearm. A large amount of stolen property related to the auto burglaries was recovered at the scene. The Mitsubishi was later found unoccupied and recovered in Oakland, California. The plainclothes officers involved in this incident were not wearing body-worn cameras, often referred to as BWCs. Current San Francisco Police Department policies allow BWC exemptions for officers working certain plainclothes assignments. This particular operation met the BWC exemptions. Nearby vid businesses provided surveillance video of various portions of this incident. Additional vi video is still being sought by investigators. Witnesses to the officer-involved shooting incident have been interviewed, and additional witnesses are being sought by investigators. Witnesses have been interviewed related to the auto burglary incidents, which as described, occurred prior to the officer-involved shooting. As mentioned, the subject involved in this officer-involved shooting is Xavier Pittman Jr with a date of birth of January 26, 1998. Mr. Pittman was arrested by the San Francisco Police Department 
and booked at the San Francisco County Jail for the following charges. 459, second degree of the California B Penal Code, auto burglary, a felony, five counts. 182, parentheses A, parentheses one of the California Penal Code, conspiracy, a felony, five counts. 496, parentheses A of the California Penal Code, possession of a st stolen property, a felony, one count. And finally, 12022.1 of the California Vehicle Code, or Penal Code, excuse me, committing a felony while on release, one count. The officer involved in this officer involved shooting is Officer Zachary McAuliffe. The Independent Investigations Bureau of the San Francisco District Attorney's Office and the SFPD Investigative Services Detail are conducting an investigation into this incident. The Department of Police Accountability is conducting an independent administrative investigation. The SFPD Internal Affairs Division is conducting an administrative investigation. Today's presentation is provided in a multimedia format. In an effort to provide a transparent and comprehensive perspective of this incident, the SFPD will provide 911 calls, police dispatch audio, surveillance video, still photos, crime scene investigation photos, maps, and related visual aids. Our presentation today consists of relevant known video and audio at this time but is not intended to provide all photos, videos, or testimonial information related to this investigation. I will now provide a chronological presentation of this incident using these multimedia resources. The majority of the videos shown are in their unedited form and are shown as provided to SFPD. At select points, to increase transparency for viewers, the video has been enhanced to allow for a better perspective of this incident. Please note that this presentation, the enhanced video, and the unedited video will all be available on the SFPD website immediately following this town hall event. Prior to the beginning of each segment of audio or video, I will provide a brief description to orient the viewer to the time, place, and location of the content about to be shown. Please be advised that personal identify, identifying information such as names, license plates, and phone numbers have been redacted for the privacy of 911 callers and victims. This redaction will be apparent on the audio transmissions as a momentary beep to cover the personal identifying information. You're about to see relevant video footage and learn about other evidence related to this case so you can have a better understanding of what occurred based upon what we know right now. We are still in the very early stages of an investigation that can take months to complete, and our understanding of this incident may change as additional evidence is collected and reviewed. We do not draw any conclusion as to whether the officers acted consistent with our policies and the law until all the facts are known and the investigation is complete. A word of caution. The images and information you are about to see and hear may be disturbing. When a police officer uses force to arrest a suspect or defend against attack, the images are graphic and may be difficult to watch. In addition, there may be strong language used in some of the videos. Viewer discretion is advised, especially for young and sensitive viewers. We encourage those in need of help to contact the San Francisco Department of Public Health Crisis Line at area code 415-970 3800. Again,
This series of incidents included 911 calls as well as the dispatch calls for service over police radio. This audio was provided to the San Francisco Police Department from the San Francisco Department of Emergency Management. DEM provides dispatch services for the fire and police departments in San Francisco. I will now place 12 separate audio clips, which consist of 911 calls and police radio transmissions related to this incident. Please be advised that you will hear reference to the police radio code 852 several times throughout the following radio transmissions. 852 is SFPD radio code for an auto burglary or car break-in and is used by officers and dispatchers during radio communication. First audio clip is a 911 caller reporting an auto burglary by the Japanese Tea Garden in Golden Gate Park. Friday, May. San Francisco 911 Medical. Hello? Yes, what was it? San Francisco 911. It was a smash and grab on the car. Where? Did you get the license plate in Golden Gate Park? Hang on a second. Um. Eleven. The, the license plate. Sorry. The, yeah, seconds. the whole group of us thought uh, okay. the license plate of the car that took the stuff was, <laughs> and it's a. What can you tell? What it is? A, sil Eleven, a silver five, eclipse. Four, five, 50, one, seven, the guy. Can you give clock. me phonetics on the license plate? A K like king, B like boy, B like boy. Okay, sure. Yeah, they were, the bees were uh, boys, boys. Can you say it again? Show it again. I have it. I just need to make sure that I copy it correctly. Okay. So, again, it's... Any California. weapons? Uh, didn't see any weapons. Uh, they had something to smash the window. Uh, they were all in black. How many people? How many were there? Were there three? Huh? So uh, three or four, and he's got this guy. Uh, the guy, this bicyclist, has a has a picture. It looks like one was in a gray hoodie, with uh, black pants with white stripes on it. Gray hoodie, black pants with stripes. Yeah, and a back, uh, a black, a black um, um, uh, head covering balaclava. All right. Now listen, I have I have an officer on the way, but I need to confirm your location. Um, you're okay. on Mother. Martin Luther King Drive? Friday. Is this Martin Luther King Drive? Right, right across from the big botanical gardens. Up, up, uh, yeah, just uh, north of the Japanese gardens. Uh, on the right side. North of the Japanese tea garden. Eleven. Okay, listen, I have officers on the way. Which way did the car go? I'm sorry. Oh, it went, uh, the car went west. 1140 on Martha Luther 40, King Drive. One second. Yeah. Okay. And the vehicle that they broke into, 11, 40, can you give me a yes. description? 50, sure. It's a uh, and their license plate is And what color is it? It's black. And they broke in the back window. So I see that you are near um, the water. Is there like a little lake there? Are you on the side of the lake uh, or on the other side? Oh, I don't know. Where, is there a lake near here? We're on the road. Eleven forty. Where's the yeah, lake? So I think yeah. the parallel street is uh, a Stow Lake Drive. Oh, I just yeah, wanted to make sure yeah. that you are on the Martin Luther King 11, 40, side. 40, yeah, yeah. 40, oh, okay. um, if you have a number that uh, the, the bicep can, can text you the photo. Unfortunately, I don't have capability for text just yet. But oh, um, if it. you gave it what the plate is going to be more than enough, and we can have okay. a name and number if we need to get the picture, then they can uh, call him. Otherwise, okay. with the plea that yeah. you gave me would be enough. I have an officer on the way right now, and we are broadcasting the information for officers in the area. Did you happen okay. to see the race of the subject or no? Uh, no, didn't, I didn't see the race. Or any age at all, how old they might have been? Uh, age, uh, no. 
Okay. I mean, they were very thick. Could, oh, hang on a second. He's looking. 11, 40, 8, do you have, do you have your, your name and number that you can, uh, she can take down? If he's one of them. Not very tall. Thinks <laughs> black. Looks female. Maybe. Yeah. Eleven. Well, I can't tell the race. That's okay. Uh, but not very tall. The, the height of the height of the car, so not very tall. Little five something. Uh, man, she's looking right at you. Um, yeah. So what's what's your name? Uh, my name is. And your phone number? Correct. Okay. Okay. And how about your name, sir? Okay, my name is. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. your callback number? And you also saw it? Yes. Okay. Now, my last question what did they take from the victim vehicle? Uh, what did they take from the victim's vehicle? Could you tell? I couldn't. What, what did they take? Could you tell? I couldn't tell. They grabbed, they, they knocked in the back window and the side of the windows. So I think probably whatever they saw. But it was amazing. They, they just pulled up their car, smashed, grabbed, and, and left. It was, it was, okay. Thank you so much for calling. I just want to confirm if the silver eclipse they Thank you so much for calling, sir. We're on the way. We're in the area for a second to see if we find the vehicle, and we'll be coming looking. We'll be looking for the victim vehicle. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You, sir. Bye bye. You're welcome. Yep. Bye. Three audio clips related to auto burglaries near Leavenworth and Jefferson Streets. The first is a 911 call reporting an auto burglary, and the second two clips are dispatch transmissions. Fiscal 911, what's the station application emergency? Hi there, I just uh, saw a robbery happen. Do I report that via you? Uh, so why don't you tell me exactly what happened? I'm sitting in my car in um, near in around Fishman's Wharf in San Francisco, and I was just sitting in my car on my phone, and I heard. Um, a car glass break and I looked up and I saw this car parked next, double parked next to a the guy ran in uh, broke the glass reached his body all the way in okay. grabbed a purse from inside the car where, where was away. it exactly? let me look up where I am okay. um, what's your phone number while you get that? And just, yeah, go ahead and give me the location of where it happened. Yeah, I'm currently on Leavenworth Street, about midway between Jefferson and Beach Street. Give me the location one more time. On Leavenworth Street, between... Um, Let's see. Um, sorry, I have to. I have to move. I'm, I was sitting. Uh, to leave the space where I was double parked. Um, I was. I was between Beach Street and Jefferson Street, about midway on the street. And then, how long ago was this? Twenty-one minutes, maybe two minutes ago. Okay, how long? One second here. I'm just gonna get the officers there right now. Um, Twenty-seven and. Okay, and then the were they in a vehicle, the one that broke in? Yeah, and I took a couple pictures of the vehicle. Okay, what's the uh, the vehicle? Um, sorry, if you don't mind just giving me a moment, I need to find a place that I can stop, so that I'm not. <laughs> Do you remember um, from from your memory, um, like the prop, like what uh, what color it was? Um, yeah, it was a silver SUV. I don't know. Okay. Um, sorry, just it's all right. I, and then I, you might have the license plate, right? Six seconds. I have the license plate. That's right. Okay. Okay. Once. And then which way did it go? 
it went straight down the street, and then um, there were two other like, guys on the street who um, watched saw it happen too. Okay, and they but told me to call the cops, so I wasn't. I didn't pay attention to which way they turned after that. So what, did they go down Leavenworth? Yeah, they were. They were. Uh, it was on Leavenworth towards the water. That's okay, so they they headed they headed towards the water. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Okay, one second. Oh, what's going? Twelve, twenty-eight, and forty-six seconds. And then the the vehicle they broke into, what color was it? It was oh yeah yeah okay all right. And I have that I have that um okay uh what's my call it? Do you see the officer? I'm sorry, what was that? Do you see the officer that just sent them to Leavenworth and Jefferson? They said they came on scene just right now. Um, I'm I'm turning back onto that street right now. I have to get go around the block to the FedEx. Our UPS truck was beeping at me to leave. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Uh, but I, I'll be back there in just a moment. Okay, all right. 29 and 36 seconds. Uh, what kind of car are you in? 12, 20, I'm in oh. seconds. I'm just going to let them know you're coming back. Um, I go. 12, 30, With officers. Zero, you don't see the officers? Seconds. I don't know. Okay. Are you, are you on Leavenworth between Jefferson and Beach? Friday. Yeah, May, I just got back seven, here and I don't two. see that. Okay, I'm going to turn around and, and park it. Okay. And or just stay there to see if your hazard lights on. 12, yeah, the... Um, six seconds. The, Hold on. I'm letting them know right uh, now. Sorry, I sent it up right away. That's why then I think they were nearby, so they got 30, there pretty quick. 30, 30, um, that's okay. I, yeah, I don't, I don't see them though, which is kind of odd. Um, what's your name? It's not great. 12, 30, and 46 seconds. Um, oh, they're one block away. 12, 30, oh, okay. I'm just, okay. I'm just right now, but I'll be here when they get there. Okay, so you're, you're still on Leavenworth, right, between Beach and Jefferson? That's exactly right. 30, okay, all right. I have to put your hazard zero, lights on six, and flag seven. them down when they get there. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Friday, May 7th. You, did you remember who broke into the vehicle? Do you, like, you know, a race they were, white, black, white, under Asian? One and... I couldn't tell because they were wearing a full face mask, which, you know, in this time means and nothing. To yeah, yeah, yeah. Like how, how tall was, was it? A male or a female? 30, it was definitely a man, 30, a pretty skinny, 30, tall man, I would say. How, like about how tall? Over, I would say probably between six, six 12, feet and 30, six four. I was, oh, I was very tall. My okay. car so I couldn't tell exactly. But what color jacket not, was he wearing? Not four. He was wearing all black. All black. Okay. 30, what did they use to break into the the vehicle? Seconds. I it, honestly, I I only saw them like right after it was already broken. It, okay. I, for like a hot Two, second, it seems like he used his elbow, but that doesn't even make sense, right? Like you can't use your elbow to break into a car, but like it seems like they were like ready that they were uh, yeah. you know had prepared to do all of this. Okay. What's your name? 16 seconds. Hello? Sorry, can oh. you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Well, sorry, what is your name? Sorry, I accidentally muted myself. Uh, the, uh, and if the police driver coming up now, uh, okay. or the police officer, is my, my full first name is... All right, okay. I'll let them know. You see the officer? Yeah, I do. Okay, flag um, them down. Yeah, he's, he's, they're right in front of me now. Should I thank hang up and talk to them? Yeah, yeah talk to them. Talk to them. No, just talk to them. Okay. All right, thank you. Bye okay, bye. thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Central two, Central three, April eight five two, Leavenworth and Jefferson. Twelve twenty eight. Adam thirteen Charles, master report, send it. Adam thirteen Charles, copy. Two ago between Jefferson and Beach. 852 suspect vehicle, 12, silver 20, SUV. 50 seconds. They're trying to get plate info. He has photos. 
Last seen uh, going towards the water. Out of thirteen control, 97. 97. Victim vehicles of... Out of thirteen controls with updated suspect description. Go ahead. It's going to be a Mitsubishi SUV with a license plate of... It's white. Silver in color. A firm, uh, silver in color SUV. Clips are related to Pier 35. They consist of one 911 call and three police radio transmissions. Volley Central 4, you find two cases, Pier 35. They're in a great Mitsubishi. Eclipse Cross. And 44. Last seen southbound on the Barcadero. Info only. This is Adam 13 Charles's vehicle, and that plate. So the plates have been switched. Headquarters is three, Adam, four, Adam. Can you go to uh, the area of Pier 35 and look for this uh, 852 suspect vehicle that's for the 13 Charles's uh, run? 10 four, It's going to be a silver Mitsubishi SUV. The plate on it is 852 over there. It's Leavenworth and Jefferson and now just seen by a 909 at Pier 35 area. Info only Central 4, 852 Casers, Pier 35. They're in a great Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. Last seen southbound on the Barcadero. Info only. San Francisco 911, what's the exact location of your emergency? Uh, yeah, no, I'm right in front of Pier 35. Okay, what's the emergency? Uh, there was a group of dudes just looking in cars and driving around, checking every car. And uh, yeah. They were cussing at some dudes that noticed that they were looking in their own car. So they came after them and they started you know, cussing back and they drove off. It was like four guys dressed in black and they had black masks on. And yeah, I have a picture of their license plate on their car. Hold on. So if you can you want to run that. So they were all in one car? Yeah, they were on one car. What kind of car was it? I think it was a Pontiac. Let me check. What I have the plate, so I mean, you can run the plate. Yes, I'll take that in a minute. What color is the vehicle? Yeah, hold on. So it's a Mitsubishi. It's a gray one. Gray Mitsubishi. It's an Eclipse Cross. Eclipse Cross, you said? Yeah, an Eclipse Cross. And what's the license plate, please? Uh, the license plate is. Yeah, I have the picture. You, I'm looking at it. Did you see any yeah. um, weapons on these people? No, I didn't see them on or anything. But yeah, they they were super blatant, obvious in what they were doing. And were you able to see what race they were? Yeah, uh, the dude that I saw, well, the dude that got out of the car, he was black. Okay. You only saw one guy as black, the others you didn't know. The, the car looked cool. There were four people in it, just one dude would get off. Okay. But they were all wearing like the same kind of get up. They had their hoods on, they had masks on. And, and then, yeah, just one dude was looking through all the cars. Okay. Did you want to leave your name and number? Yeah, my name. And I just want to come from the location is in front of Pier 35? Yeah, there's a parking lot that's in front of there, a public parking lot. Okay. All right, thank you. Did you want to meet with officers, or are you okay? No, I'm okay. Um, I, I'm not from here anyway. Okay. Uh, All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for calling in. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Do you know? Oh, by the way, do you know what direction they headed off to? Um, so they went to the Cardinal. I'm not very good at the Cardinal here. I think. Um, are they going? They went away from Pier 39. They went towards oh, the like other the side, towards the numbers. Way? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so they're, they're on Barcadero. On Embarcadero, but heading southbound on Embarcadero. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye bye. The next two audio clips consist of police radio transmissions related to auto burglaries at Washington and Drum Streets and Washington and the Embarcadero. 
out of 46. Friday, May. Three out of 46. 2021. Can you get a plate and set cat, please? Seven and 18 seconds. Go ahead with the description and then the plate. Copy. Well, I'm going to be at uh, Washington and Drum. It's going to be a uh, Mazda SUV, uh, four door. It was a, like a dark blue in color. It's going to be. She has to be, uh, the model number is going to be CX5. 13, 20, I feel like I saw this somewhere. Stand by. Out of 46. Friday, May 7, 2021. 13, 31, and 36. Okay, I think I have a second uh, victim. It's going to be on the Embarcadero. Just across from the ferry building. It's on the uh, south side of Embarcadero. It's going to be a white Audi Q5. You ready for the Cowboys? Is that in the parking lot? Uh, negative. It's actually right by the uh, Justin Herman Plaza, I guess. It's uh, parked on the street. Go with the plate. Cow plate. The victim ain't five two vehicle copy. Hey, can you give me a call? Copy. The final two audio clips consist of radio transmissions made by SFPD officers after the officer involved shooting. Three Adam 37, code 33 on uh, two. two Adam 37, go ahead with your team. Uh, we're going to need a, uh, it's a silver Mitsubishi 852 vehicle just fled uh, Varney towards, I think, third. And we need a 408. <laughs> Adam 37, copy. Varney at third. Yeah, 3 on 37, uh, 408, code 3. Uh, there's a uh, suspect here. He's uh, got some uncontrolled bleeding from his wrist. Varney and uh, Varney and uh, South Park. Jack London. Varney and Jack London. Varney and Jack London, copy. Adam 37, do you have direction of travel? No, it fled, uh, it fled on Varney towards uh, fourth. Copy. On Varney towards fourth. Yeah, we need a code three. Turn and get applied. Ten four, it's coming. Code three, do you? May seven two. Hey, two oh one, give us the unit. Twelve forty nine. Three hundred thirty seven. Seconds. Boy twelve Adam. Copy, boy twelve Adam. Twelve forty. Vehicle description. It's a gray Mitsubishi, silver in color. SUV. On Varney towards fourth. Three seconds. Two oh one. I think you just broadcast a uh, car on an all getting on the freeway. Yeah, then for last direction to travel, where last call we got was it got on the freeway. Adam thirty seven is saying on Varney towards fourth. Zero three. And uh, we need a uh, one hundred unit here. Two thousand. And uh, you could uh, we could have units to block off some traffic. Please here at uh, Barney and uh, Jack London, please. Both ends of uh, Barney. Copy. Both ends of Barney used to be blocked off. Boy 15, Adam, for that. Boy 15, Adam, copy. All right, Charlie, 98. 50 and 33 seconds. 201 and 105, we're 98. 201 and the 105, copy. 12, 50 and 43 seconds. Yeah, Adam, 15, Charlie, I'm 2. We're 98 as well. Adam will fight Charlie, copy. And, uh, the FYI, uh, it's going to be a, uh, GSW to the hand. Copy. Adam 37, copy. Adam 37. 7, 2, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, Copy dispatch. Can you put that out for CHP? That vehicle might be going towards the area. Copy. Dispatch up the four away from up Jack London from uh, the Bryant. Copy. Three seconds. Jack London from uh, Brandon. Jack London from Brandon. Copy. Seconds. Yeah, going to a one ninety-seven. Taking command. It's going to be an OIS. Copy. Two, 
Go for it, boy. The best approach is probably going to be off of Bryant. Three. John, two one, the boy, two one. What? Yeah, I'm sending some units over to help give you guys a hand. I will now play videos related to the officer involved shooting. The first surveillance video was obtained from a stationary surveillance camera. The camera is fixed on the east side of Jack London Alley, facing south towards Brandon Street. The T intersection on the right side of the screen is Barney Place. This is a fixed video only surveillance camera that does not record audio. I will now play the same video enhanced at certain points to identify the participants, equipment, and location.
Next is video from a fixed video only camera located on the north wall of Varney Place facing east. The suspect vehicle will come into view and park near the wall on the right side of your screen. We'll now play the same video, enhanced at certain points to identify the participants, equipment, and location.
The next video is from a fixed camera on the north wall of Varney Place. This video captures audio of the officer involved shooting incident and shows the suspect vehicle fleeing westbound on Varney Place. A hit and run vehicle collision occurred as the suspect vehicle fled. I will now play the same video, which is enhanced at select points. The next video is from a camera on Varney Place pointed towards northbound 3rd Street. The Mitsubishi is seen fleeing with the rear hatch open, turning north onto 3rd Street. I will now replay the video, which again has been enhanced at certain points. Our next video is from a fixed surveillance camera showing the suspect vehicle fleeing onto northbound 3rd Street. The next video is the last video. It has been enhanced at certain points. I will now display three photographs taken by the Crime Scene Investigations Unit during and after scene processing, and one map charting the locations of the incidents discussed in this presentation. This is a perspective photo of the scene from the east side looking west. The second photo is a photo of the uh, victim vehicle in the hit and run that occurred as the suspect vehicle fled west on Varney Place.
The third and final photograph is a photograph of Officer McAuliffe's department issued firearm. This map, as shown throughout the presentation, marks the seven incidents that have been discussed in this presentation. My presentation is complete. We will now hear some additional remarks from Chief Scott. Thank you, Commander O'Sullivan. To the public, I'd like to point out that we take feedback very seriously. Based on feedback from prior officer-involved shooting town halls, we will also take questions and answer, and answer them to the extent we're able to, understanding that it, this incident remains an ongoing investigation. We've already received questions from members of the media asking if this shooting was unintentional or negligent discharge. It is too early in the investigation to make a determination but as I said earlier, this should never had happened. I will address, however, some of the questions now so we can use the time we have for other questions. As I said in my opening remarks, although this investigation has not reached a final conclusion, I can say that based on what we know at this time, the evidence and the facts of this case, including the video, video evidence that you saw, witnesses and our member statements that the shooting of Mr. Pittman quite simply should not have happened. And I wanna say again to Mr. Pittman and his family and friends that I'm deeply sorry that Mr. Pittman was shot during this incident. Beyond the policy, uh, beyond the, the apology that I've expressed, Officer McAuliffe, through his attorney, has asked that we post his own apology to Mr. Pittman for this incident as a part of the online content that is part of this officer-involved shooting town hall. The full text of Officer McCullough's statement will be available on our website at sanfranciscopolice.org. But to summarize, Officer McAuliffe asked me to convey through his attorney how badly he feels that this happened. He did not intend for his gun to go off and he sincerely apologizes to Mr. Pittman and wishes Mr. Pittman a full and speedy recovery. As to the question of whether or not this officer involved shooting was unintentional, that is a part of a legal determination to be made by the San Francisco City and County District Attorney and their independent criminal investigation. Administratively, our department, General Order 8.11, defines any discharge of an officer's firearm that results in injury or death as an officer-involved shooting. What that means is the shooting, whether unintentional or not, is adjudicated administratively through the lens and standards of our use of force policy, General Order 5.01. That standard classifies the use of a firearm as a deadly force, a use of deadly force, which can only be used as a last resort when reasonable alternatives have been exhausted or are not feasible to protect the public and police officers. In summary, an officer is authorized to use deadly force when the officer has reasonable cause to believe that he or she or another person is in immediate danger of death or serious bodily injury. I'd like to reiterate that during the investigation of an officer involved shooting and at the investigation's conclusion, conclusion, we look at the facts and evidence through the lens of standards set by our use of force policy and from the lens of our training guidelines to reach an administrative conclusion. Those standards are purposefully set very high and our use of force policy is considered by many to be a model policy. 
At this point in the investigation, we are focused administratively on looking at this case through the lens of our use of force general order 5.01, as I mentioned, our use of firearms general order 5.02, investigation of officer involved shootings and discharges, general order 8.11, as well as our arrest and control manual in regard to the physical, physical control tactics and the physical arrest of Mr. Pittman. For any persons that are following this case and would like to compare the facts as we know them today to our use of force general order, as well as our other general orders, all of our general orders can be found on our website, again, at www.sanfranciscopolice.org. Now I'd like to say a few words to our SFPD officers. I, the command staff and the public expect a lot from you, sometimes even perfection. As your chief, I realize just how difficult your job is, especially during these times in policing. Our city has been plagued the last several years with car break-ins. The work that was being performed to address our car break-in issue prior to this officer involved shooting was exactly what I and the public expect you to do. While I and this department sincerely apologizes to Mr. Pittman for this officer involved shooting, we, the San Francisco Police Department and all of its members owe it to the public and ourselves as committed professionals to our profession to continue to prevent, detect and solve car break-ins and all crime in our city and vigorously pursue and hold accountable those who victimize residents and visitors in our great city. To the SFPD officers, we still have a job to do. Please keep your heads up and your spirits up and continue to do the great job that you do day in and day out. Lastly, before we take the public's questions, I'd like to update you on what steps we've taken to revisit our policies and training to prevent a recurrence of this type of incident. First, until further notice, I have directed all district station plain clothes to continue their investigations, but not conduct operations in plain clothes until we review and revise where necessary our training policies and protocols regarding district station plain clothes operations. Next, I have directed our written directives unit to revisit our BWC policy and make policy recommendations for police commission consideration as it pertains to plain clothes operations. Next, I have directed the deputy chief of our administration bureau to have our training division subject matter experts immediately create roll call training and refresher updates for arrest and control tactics with an emphasis on SFPD standards and expectations of its members in regard to physical control holes. All sworn members will receive this refresher training once it's developed. And lastly, I've directed our concerned command staff members to expedite policy recommendations for our plainclothes units at the district station level for police commission consideration. And on that note, our assistant chief, Michael Redman, met with all the captains of all 10 district stations and their plainclothes sergeants and explain these steps to them and why we are doing what they, what we are doing. And I, I, I need to let the public know that our command staff, the district station captains, the plainclothes supervisors are on board and they understand that we need to be at our best when we protect and serve this city and they are on board with these changes and the steps that I have taken. Now we will take questions from the public. The public comment portion of this town hall will now begin. The length of time for public comment will be one hour. To call into the meeting, please call 1-669-900-6800 Three, three. Again, that's one six 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 nine nine zero zero six eight three three. Please enter meeting code eight four eight four four two three three one eight one. 
enter passcode 773772. You may also participate in public comment via Zoom by clicking the link in the description below the video presentation. Each public comment caller will have up to two minutes to speak. If you wish to join the queue for public comment, please listen carefully to the following instructions. Interpretation is available in both Spanish and Cantonese. If you are watching on Zoom, you may click the interpretation button and select your preferred language. This is available on web and on the Zoom mobile app. If you are watching on Zoom, you may request to speak by using the raise hand function under reactions. You will be prompted to unmute yourself when it is your turn to speak. When you are done speaking, please remute yourself. If you are calling into the meeting, again, please call 1-669-900-6833. Enter meeting code 848-4423-3181. Then enter passcode 773772. You may press star nine to raise your hand and get in the queue to speak for public comment. You will be prompted when to unmute yourself when it is your turn to speak. You may unmute yourself by pressing star six. When you are done speaking, please remute yourself. Once again, each caller will have up to two minutes to provide public comment for this town hall meeting. Your two minutes will begin once you unmute yourself and begin speaking. Moderators, at this time, I'd ask that you please invite the first caller in to speak. We have not gotten any questions yet via the chat, nor via raised hands. For those in the Zoom meeting, you can find the raised hand option in your options bar under reactions. Please click reactions and click the raised hand button. Once you do so, we will call on you and ask you to unmute yourself. At this time, at this time, we have zero callers and I will reread the instructions. To call into the meeting, please call 1-669-900-6833. Enter meeting code 848-4423-3181. Enter passcode 773772. You may also participate in public comment via Zoom by clicking the link in the description below the video presentation. For those callers who have just joined, if you would like to raise your hand, if you're calling in, please press star nine. If you are joining via Zoom, please use the... Okay, we've got one raised hand from a caller. I will be, you will be asked to unmute yourself. Hello, you're unmuted. If you have a question, please ask now. Hello, is that me? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. I I um I noticed that uh, Chief Scott apologized to the I guess he was um, the victim who was shot, but did he apologize to the officer who was put in that position who did not know whether his life was in danger or not? That is my question. Your question that uh, your dog is barking in the background. So can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat your question? Can I ask my question now? It appears that caller disconnected. However, we have another raised hand. It appears that caller disconnected. However, we have another raised hand. Hello? Hi, this is Xavier Pittman's mother. Okay, our caller disconnected. However, we have another raised hand. When can I speak? Hello? Hello, this is Xavier Pittman's mother. Hi, this is Xavier Pittman's mother. Okay, our caller disconnected. However, we have another raised hand. Can I speak? When can I speak? Hello? Hello, this is Xavier Pittman's mother. Hi, this is Xavier Pittman's mother. Hello. Hand. Hello, can you hear me? Can I? We can hear you, but it sounds like you're standing Hello? next to a broadcast and it's catching feedback. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm calling. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the chief for his excellent Hello. broadcast today. Can you hear me? Can I? We can hear you, but it sounds like you're standing Hello? next to a broadcast and it's catching feedback. Oh, okay. So I'm calling. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the chief for his excellent broadcast today. I also would like to say that my son was shot in his wrist, which shattered his wrist. He has pins and rods in his wrist. He was also hit in his main artery. He also was took into custody. After he was already obtained and detained by the officer. We have no evidence that my son even exited this vehicle due to the fact that your officers were on standby on the side of the buildings. So my son actually appeared at court today for this matter and all cases were dropped. So basically my son is disabled for the rest of his life due to your officer accidentally shooting his gun. discharging his firearm. This kid is 23 years old and will never be able to work for the rest of his life.
never be able to work for the rest of his life. Due to your officer accidentally discharging his firearm on a car burglary suspect, when does that ever go on? I'm going to try to address your question the best that I can. Um, as you know, I stated in the presentation, we have not and adjudicated this case yet. And you know, the reason that I apologize to you and your family and and, and your son was because you know we believe it should, at this point in the investigation that it shouldn't have happened. So yes, you're absolutely right. It should not have happened. Um, we still have some investigation to do, and I uh, thank you so much for calling in because um, it gives me an opportunity to say this to you that I'm truly sorry for what happened to your son. And as far as the criminal justice system, you know, I, the case and the evidence will, will go its course through the criminal justice system in terms of the car burglaries, and you know we'll see where that lands. But in terms of the officer-involved shooting, which is the reason we're here today. I just want you to know that, you know, it should not have happened and we are sorry. We have another raised hand. The broadcast while you're making your comment so that we can hear you clearly. Yes, I'm curious how after reported of a six, seven incidents where a crime is committed in our city and action is being taken to resolve that. But of course it was an accident, but at what point do you support the officers? They are putting their life on the line and it, it, it seems like a simple mistake, but these people, were committing crimes and they were stealing and they were being reckless in our city and they come from another city. So when do we harbor our own, you know, identity for safety? For your call. And again, uh, going back to what I said earlier, our officers day in and day out, do an outstanding job and they do exactly what we asked them to do to address this issue. And they were doing that up to the point where this, this incident turned into an officer involved shooting. Um, we do need to support our officers. They have an awfully tough job, uh, particularly this past year, but at the same time, we have to hold ourselves accountable to the standards. Our use of force policies are very clear and they're designed that way for a reason. So at the end of all this, we will measure the officer's performance in the lens of the use of force report. We'll take into account all factors and we will make the appropriate decision. But thank you for calling. Officers do need to be supported. Uh, this is a hard job and they have to make split second decisions. And for anybody who's listening in the audience, I'm not making excuses for officers doing their job. But what I'm saying is when we do our jobs, the public expect us to do it right particularly when we use a firearm. And we have to make sure that we use our firearms when we have to use it through the lens and the standards of our use of force policy. And that's how ultimately this case will be measured. But I know our officers do a good job because I see the work day in and day out. And you're absolutely right, they do. And they were doing what we asked them to do in terms of addressing the car burglary problem in this city. Uh, when this incident happened. We have one, another raised hand. So once again, I would like to thank the chief again for his phenomenal broadcast today. I also would like to address a couple of other situations. So I am all for protect and serve. I do not um, agree with anything that's going on 
um, far as criminal activity within our city. Let's get that straight. So my thing is, you know, from what I, my understanding is, um, an officer is only supposed to discharge his firearm if his life is in danger. Now, if my son was already apprehended by his partner and another officer gun was accidentally discharged, how about if he would have shot his partner on accident? And, you know, I hear all these people coming on here, you know, regarding the officers and the officers did what they supposed to do. But if this was your child, you'll be saying the same thing as well. So here we are again. I'm totally with protect and serve, okay, because I'm an honest person of the community, and I do not agree with anything that's going on far as, you know, crimes and everything be committed. I do not tolerate it. I, I, I do not indulge in it or anything of that nature. But at the same time, you have to remember this 23-year-old child that was shot is someone's child, and it's a very sensitive situation. So when y'all coming on here glorifying these cops that discharge their firearm accidentally, I feel some type of way about that. I hold no malice. I hold no grudge. Shit happens in the world. But for you guys to glorify a police for shooting a young African-American child in these time and days when this is going on normally, it's not okay. Okay, we have another raise hand. Yeah, I agree. I understand the sensitive, sensitive subject of the matter, but at the same time, these are the people that keep us safe. If people are committing crimes and they're being reported and there's numerous events of illegal activity, then something needs to happen. And it's unfortunate that what happened happened, you know, but it's in, we, the streets need to be safe and it's not safe with the stuff that's going on. So you need to keep that in mind when we go through these issues. It's about accountability. There are no more raised hands at this time. At this time, at this time, we have no hands raised. I will read, read the instructions to call in. Please call 1-669-900-6833. Enter meeting code 848-4423-3100. Enter passcode 773772. We have no additional callers. We will end the broadcast in one minute. We have a raised hand. Hi, Chief Scott. Um, as you said multiple times, this shooting should not have occurred. So regardless of whether this was an accident or the result of criminal negligence, it seems that this will likely result um, in the payout of a significant settlement by the city to the victim. 
Uh, do you support taking these legal payouts out of the SFPD budget, or do you believe that violent misconduct settlements are simply the cost of doing business? Thank you. For your call, um, the, the city, it comes out of the city's budget, the general fund, and definitely uh, that, that, as you mentioned, if this case goes in, in that direction, it comes out of the city's budget. Uh, it impacts the city's availability of funding, and there, those cases are settled uh, in, in case uh, in court and by a legal process. So we don't know what's going to happen on this case, but I can just say to your question, as best as I can answer it, it comes out of the city's budget, and you know it impacts our availability of funds, and that includes the police department. So thank you for your call. At this time, we have no hands raised. If we do not receive any calls in one minute, we will end the broadcast. broadcast. At this time, we will conclude the broadcast as there are no more queue callers in the queue. Thank you.